I'm Cliff Lynch, and I'll be um, leading this conversation this morning. The topic is um, really what we do about the fact that increasingly um, the analog of personal papers is turning into a very complicated digital thing. And to try and understand at least a little bit of what that means for um, uh, archives and research libraries and other institutions who are concerned with managing this kind of material. And basically, I want to do three things this morning. The first is to just um, briefly cover a little bit of background um, on this area and point you to a few resources that you may or may not have come across uh, to dig deeper. The second is to talk a little bit about a um, conference that uh, I attended on uh, the 16th of February uh, that was taking a look at developments in this area. And we're lucky to have um, Jeff Bois here, who um, was the uh, person who put that conference together. I'll give you sort of three or four takeaways that I had from that that strike me as sort of uh, fertile ground for action uh, by cultural memory institutions. I'll invite Jeff to add his reflections on that meeting, um, and then uh, uh, I'll open things up for a broader conversation about uh, where we might go from here on some of these issues. So that's, that's the agenda for the next, um, the next hour or so. Now, let me start, as I said, with some background on this. And, you know, it's a kind of a commonplace assertion that more and more of our, you know, activities and our lives are being represented in digital form and email and um, in uh, digital documents that uh, even all of many of our sort of day-to-day -day transactions, the kinds of things that filled up filing cabinets with old bank statements and canceled checks and uh, airplane tickets and all that sort of wonderful stuff is moving into digital form. And you know, certainly um, while many people throw this sort of thing away periodically, um, there are lovely examples of um, important um, uh, figures of, of a historical or literary nature who felt compelled to keep every check they wrote and made some biographer very happy later. Um, uh, and now, of course, there are some people who are doing this just quite automatically because the files get saved and they never think to purge them. Um, and there are others who are, you know, more um, systematic about eliminating this kind of material. Uh, certainly, there has been a lot of discussion over the past decade or so about, um, uh, you know, personal habits and hygiene as it uh, relates to um, personal computers and backup and this sort of activity. Uh, there were some, you know, very fascinating and frightening kinds of studies coming out in uh, the early 2000s uh, that suggested that at that time, at least, many consumers were not doing much backup and actually were adopting this sort of strange um, uh, fatalistic attitude towards their digital files where they simply accepted the fact that they were all washed away every few years and you started over with you know most of, w w having to replace most everything and you know just with a few leftover files that you might have saved for one reason or another um, and in fact, you, ev you could even find interviews with um, people at that time who sort of welcomed that fragility and, uh, you know, the sort of notion that uh, you get this random technological clean slate every, you know, few years. Uh, since then, of course, the whole, um, the whole kind of ease of backup has changed when you look at various incremental kind of automatic backup systems. We are starting to see the emergence of 
uh, reasonably serious consumer-oriented uh, network backup services. Probably the biggest limiting factor is the uh, relatively slow speed still of most home connections, which um, limits your ability to back up over the net if you've got large numbers of files. But we're certainly seeing um, uh, some significant changes over the past 10 years. We're, we've also um, seen some really good studies of people's behavior and um, practices and uh, um, vulnerabilities in terms of digital material. Uh, Kathy Marshall, for example, um, has done a very, very good uh, set of studies in this area. One of the findings that she came up with that was very interesting, uh, talking to people um, primarily in uh, uh, the computer and information technology related fields was that one of the great points of vulnerability for digital files was when people change jobs because in fact, um, for better or worse, they tended to get their personal and um, business files all tangled up together, you know. I mean, how, how many of us even today are really good about keeping our personal email utterly separate from our, our work email? And that, um, you know, when people changed corporate affiliations or got fired or um, moved on, uh, that often this represented an enormous disruption and they tended to realize a few years later they'd actually lost a good deal of stuff in the course of that process. Uh, we've seen the emergence in information science of a subfield uh, that goes by names like personal information management, uh, where people really um, focus a lot, uh, not just on what's kept, but on how it's organized and on ideas like um, how people actually can find the things that they already have on their hard drives as those hard drives get bigger and accrete more and more material across time. Uh, so there are um, research groups, for example, at the uh, University of Washington that have done a lot of work in that area. Um, we've also seen um, a couple of other systematic efforts um, that are worth mentioning. Um, Neil Beagery in the UK did a very, very good um, uh, study um, back around, um, I think it was 2002 or three, uh, called Plenty of Room at the Bottom, which really um, laid out uh, this sort of notion of personal and, and small organizational digital archives and um, underscored the ramifications of those for cultural memory organizations. And perhaps the biggest scale thing I've seen in the last few years is the uh, Digital Lives Project that was uh, run out of the um, British Library with funding from the JISC. Uh, uh, where um, uh, Jeremy John did, um, was the principal investigator. They just uh, quite recently put out a um, several hundred page report summarizing uh, their findings. Jeremy is an interesting fellow. Um, he, wear, he has his title at the, um, at the British Library is um, something like the keeper of um, electronic manuscripts within the, the archive division. And he's one of the few people that has spent a lot of time dealing with electronic manuscripts in a systematic way. Uh, that report out of the British Library is um, very, very much worth reading, I would say, if you're interested in this. Um, and I included the uh, URL for it in the background material for this session. There, I, I should also say, just kind of rounding out a little bit of this survey material, that there's also been a sort of a futuristic strain strung through all of this too. Um, uh, for example, you have people like Gordon Bell, who is a very um, prominent computer scientist who's currently with uh, Microsoft Research, who has been basically digitizing everything having to do with his life for the last few years. Um, 
so he, he's trying to essentially move all of the documentation of his existence into digital form. You have things like the proposals that came out a few years ago um, from ARPA about life logging and um, uh, similar kinds of things. Um, it's not clear to me where a lot of that research stands, but certainly there's, there, there's a whole thread that says, as, as we can collect more material systematically, what can we do with it? Um, and then there are also sort of sub-pieces to this that um, raise questions, for example, about how, can, we use the, can we use technology to help people whose memories are failing? For example, people who might be in the early stages of Alzheimer's um, or, or having other problems that are affecting their memory. Um, uh, elderly people who are trying to um, you know, remain independent but are sometimes having difficulty remembering things. And so there's been a, a number of R&D projects to look at kind of selective visual capture and things like that um, to, to help these people. Um, and that, that threads its way through some of this work as well. The last thing I want to say by way of kind of general background here is that it's important to realize that archives are operating a little bit in a rear view mirror. They tend to be ingesting and acquiring collections that have been built up over the past, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years. And so they, they tend to be seeing a lot of sort of last decades problems as, as they do their ingestion. Um, so right now, for example, you see archives who when they acquire an individual's personal papers will find a you know, a devil's brew of paper, of actual machines in many cases, because it turns out that there are a lot of, well, I don't know about a lot, but there are certainly a number of people who kind of identify quanta of work with machines. So for example, there are novelists who will buy a machine, write a novel, put the, that machine and that novel in the closet, it's done, get a new machine and move on to the next book. And if they need to go back to the old book for some reason, the old um, you know, machine comes out of the closet and they try and boot it up and maybe it works uh, and maybe it doesn't. Uh, and this is actually, you know, there, there's more than one person who's, um, you know, uh, uh, described exactly this kind of authorial behavior to me as, as something they're seeing um, in, their, um, in their acquisitions. The, certainly one of the other things we're seeing is uh, uh, showing up um, in acquisitions today is the legacy of the early days of the personal computer and the um, you know sort of blossoming of word processing in the 80s. Um, all kinds of nasty removable media um, filled with all kinds of nasty files from word processors long gone and never properly documented. And um, these are a real problem. Now, the interesting thing is that people are reading this as, as sort of, you know, and this will continue to be a problem. Whereas my, my guess is it's going to continue to be a problem for a while. But if you think about um, the last decade, for example, there are a very, very small number of dominant word processors and plenty of tools for converting among them. Um, that market has really consolidated and, um, uh, you know, some people would say stabilized, other people would say ossified, perhaps. Um, but uh, it's, it's really a very, very different world than that dynamic world of the um, late 80s and early 90s in word processors. The reason I mention this is because I think it's important um, to think about 
what's ahead, about what, what um, special collections people and archivists are going to be running into in 2020. And there's been at least a little bit of very useful thinking about that um, in the context of things like the Digital Lives Project. And actually, we can also see this in other sorts of social settings. Um, for example, um, uh, people dealing with the digital files of um, <coughs> folks like soldiers who have been killed, where parents or other family want to um, set up some kind of memorial or bring those files to conclusion in some way. Um, what we're seeing is that back in the 80s and 90s and even into the early 2000s, the kind of typical model was that individuals were in possession of most of their files. They were on those removable media or local computer systems by and large. Whereas today, their stuff is actually scattered across a huge range of systems out there in the so-called cloud. Um, uh, various kinds of sh social sharing systems, Flickr, um, email systems that don't follow a model of keeping most of the material local, but rather um, out in the cloud somewhere. This is a very different kind of a situation than we faced before, and one where you can imagine it really is would be tremendously difficult for someone without the you know, active complicity of the individual to go and recover substantial amounts of this and reassemble it in an orderly way. So I, I think that we need to be very mindful, and I'll come back to some of the, um, some of the direct implications of this, of what the cloud era is likely to mean in terms of our ability to capture and um, uh, manage the, the digital documentation of, of pe the lives of individuals and, and small organizations. I think there's an enormous um, problem brewing here. Uh, the last thing um, I'll just say about that cloud environment um, is that it's not just the personal files. One of the other things that happens in that cloud environment is my personal files start getting interrelated to other people's personal files. And there's a whole question of who should be responsible for, for the record of the relationships. Um, <clears throat> is the right way to think about capturing one person's material their material and the relationships attached to it? If so, how many hops out do you go? Or is a better way to think about um, these social systems that they contain lots of sort of individual material and then these big spanning graphs of relationships and we should try and work out ways where um, major institutions partner with some of these major um, social sites to actually capture the entire graph in some fashion um, and sort through all of the privacy horrors and things like that that are implicit in that. We've, we really don't know very much about this whole question of what the right approaches are to this, this world of, of um, cloud-based social services yet and, and its connection to documenting the lives of individuals. But it is abundantly clear that there are some, some new and hard issues there. <coughs> Let me step on, though, um, with that bit of background to the, um, the meeting that Jeff pulled together. And it was a meeting to really start talking about some of these issues in part from the perspective of memory organizations. And it was very appropriately held um, at the new home of the Internet Archive in San Francisco, a um, disused uh, Church of um, Christian Science that Brewster Kale has recently acquired as the new home for 
the archive, um, complete with beautiful, enormous yellow stained glass windows that allow the light to stream into the main meeting room. I mean, it's, it's really quite a spectacular place. Um, and they, they have a stage um, with um, these ranks of um, uh, about three or four foot high figures, a little bit like the Chinese um, soldiers uh, from 2,000 years ago, representing the archivists who have served at the Internet Archive, standing guard around the stage. It's, it's as spectacular a place as, as you can imagine for such a meeting. And um, uh, we spent a day, uh, a, a group of people, um, uh, talking through some of these issues. Um, I'm not going to say too much about the details of the meeting. They're very good notes up. Um, I've, I've got a pointer to the notes in the, um, in the background material uh, in the program book. Um, I do want to sort of share four points that I came away with um, very strongly that perhaps will be useful as a point of departure in our conversation. And then I'm going to um, give Jeff a couple of minutes to, um, to share his takeaways on it. I think one of the things that I was quite struck by is that um, archives and special collections and other memory organizations are not alone in this world. Um, there is a major sort of privatization thing happening. Um, some of it starts with genealogy. And there are, you know, there's enough money in genealogy now that um, for those of you who sometimes find yourself flipping around the TV late at night, um, folks like Ancestry.com have got enough money to run TV ads now. Um, admittedly, they're not doing it on the Olympics, but um, nonetheless, they are running you know, TV ads, which suggests to me there's a, a certain momentum there. Um, it's clear that while the original starting point for a lot of this was sort of hardcore genealogy, it's moving more to document your family history, upload photos, this sort of thing. Um, there are a number of tools in this area. In fact, we heard a very interesting talk um, by um, uh, someone from the Magnus Museum in Berkeley who is working with one of these tools um, they're a museum of Jewish history, and um, he, he's working with people to document stuff that he can take in using a, a Mac-based tool. Um, again, a very uh, clever kind of activity, um, uh, take, using this to structure material to make it easy for you to acquire. Um, there's also a, a whole set of kind of new players. Um, uh, like StoryCorps, who are doing oral histories primarily, who fit into this world as well. And um, we've seen some of this in the US. We've seen uh, perhaps even more aggressively in the UK, organizations like the BBC running, moving into large scale public oral history um, in various areas. So that's one observation that I think um, you know, we ought to be thinking about how we work with some of these institutions and um, uh, where we're concerned about things getting locked up, where, on the other hand, we may see very fruitful collaborations. Second point, and I can't stress this one strongly enough, um, again, speaking to this sort of backwards, this rear view um, mirror, um, uh, business with understanding what's facing archives. The future is really much more heavily multimedia. Um, 
the, if you just look at data, for example, about the number of photographs that, or digital photo images that people capture and store, as opposed to their behavior back in the days of film photography, um, there's really been, you know, like orders of magnitude increase here. And the notion that, um, you know, you're going to get hundreds of thousands of photos from many, many people uh, is not at all unreasonable. Uh, and we are going to have to stop thinking about particularly f images and probably also moving images um, uh, as sort of esoteric things and think about just expecting them in, in very, very large quantities and poorly described often or described only in kind of um, uh, contextual ways. You know, here, here's a cluster of images from March 7th. Here's another cluster of images from last year's Christmas time. So you may not know who's in it, but you'll know something about where and when they were taken because that just comes automatically increasingly with the images. Um, I think the implications of that kind of multimedia um, are, are pretty scary for a lot of um, special collections because they've just never had to deal with this before. And except for fairly rare cases, um, uh, photographs, images, you know, were off somewhere else. They were a, a specialty problem, not something that comes with almost every, um, every acquisition. Um, the next, um, the third of my four points, deposit agreements. Um, certainly, we have lots of experience with um, deeds of gift and deposit agreements uh, that people execute to transfer material over to an archive or a special collection. It seems like in the digital world, we need to think very carefully about what goes into those deeds of gift and even more, we need to think about the trust context around it. Um, I'll just give you, you know, kind of a couple of, of really quick examples here. Many people, and, and again, it's dangerous to talk generalities here, but many people really aren't hugely sophisticated about things like, um, well, what could you recover off of my computer if I gave it to you in terms of files that were erased but not zeroed out and browser histories and browser caches and all this sort of thing? Um, you actually have some scholars now who are talking about what can we do with computer forensic tools, the sorts of things that were designed for um, law enforcement organizations or intelligence organizations to um, see what they could dig up on you if they got a hold of your computer, um, even assuming that you were sophisticated about this stuff. And, um, you know, I kind of wonder where that, that leaves someone thinking about um, making such a donation. Uh, there's always been an issue of trust between archivists or curators on one side and uh, um, folks who donate material, be it a, an individual or their family after donating a deceased individual's papers. It, it seems like the whole issue of trust and appropriate behavior is really ratcheted up here because of the tendency to intermix all kinds of personal and business activity um, and, um, you know, fairly trivial things and important things in the, envir in the computing environment. I think that um, it might be very fruitful to have some conversations about model um, deeds of gift and deposit um, agreements for various kinds of material in this digital world. Um, people right now, as far as I've been able to determine, are just kind of making it up as they go along. And this might be a place where at least we could share some experience. The last point that 
I want to make, and it's a very sort of strategic one um, that I took away, is that waiting until people die, for example, and then reaching out to their families um, is going to be a increasingly ineffective tactic in the digital world, especially when you think of lives scattered across all of these cloud services, um, especially when you think about people um, dying in a, um, you know, what, a digitally intestate way. I, I don't know what the right term is, but they, they, they forgot to, you know, hand over the password dossier to their heirs. Um, along with establishing, you know, who's going to be their literary heir and all of that sort of thing. Um, big mess, potentially. Um, and also a, a very disorganized one. I mean, you don't even know where to start looking for a great deal of this material. So um, the question becomes, does it make more sense to reach out to people um, whose material you'd like to acquire for your collections and to do it early? Is that a better strategy? Um, perhaps it is. Um, it means you're now into this sort of odd mixture of um, development in that you'd like to get them to give it to you, um, hopefully for not too much uh, money or for free, even better. Um, uh, relationship building in the sense that you may want to be giving them advice about how to organize things before you get it so that they keep drafts of things that might be interesting to future scholars if they're willing to do that so that you can help separate out the personal and the, um, and the, the less personal. Um, when do you start though? Uh, I had an interesting conversation um, last year with some folks from the National Library of Wales. Um, part of their mission is to capture the Welsh literature. Um, this is a good mission to have in a way because the number of people who are writing literature in Welsh are limited and you know who most of them are and at least if you're the National Library of Wales. Um, and so you can actually reach out to them quite early in their careers and uh, help them with things like backup and kind of basic information management on one side and build relationships on the other. Um, and you know, that's, that's pretty doable for um, an enterprise on that scale, I guess. But you think about, well, what should a major research library be doing? Um, certainly, local faculty are a reasonable place to reach out. But beyond that, how do you, how do you decide who to reach out to? Um, is collection development going to start encompassing the identification of promising individuals early in their careers, whatever those careers may be, and setting out to develop those relationships. And, you know, by the way, how does this flip around to the personal side? Um, as an up-and-coming, um, you know, literary figure or public historian or something like that, are you graded in part on who you've got your archiving relationships with? Um, does that make you, uh, you know, important because um, uh, a prominent institution has reached out and said, let's work together, we'd like to archive you downstream, you're clearly a rising star. Um, one, one can imagine some very strange kind of uh, social output from this. But um, nonetheless, the, the, the sort of core takeaway here is that um, it's going to get less and less practical to do a thorough job on the digital lives of individuals um, if they are picked up very, very late in the process and particularly after the individual who created them dies unless that individual was um, 
uh, pretty um, unusually systematic about making provisions for this to happen. So those were probably the four, um, the, the four biggest uh, um, conclusions that I left this meeting with. Um, I'd like to open this up to discussion, particularly about this question of what are the actionable strategies for memory institutions in this area? Um, what should they be doing and what are, what are useful prospects for areas where groups of these institutions might collaborate? But just before I do that, I want to give um, Jeff an opportunity to say a few things um, briefly about his reflections on that meeting. Why don't you just grab that? Thank you very much, Cliff. That was a really good summary, and thank you for the support at that meeting at the Internet Archive. It, I think, drew uh, other people there to have you attend. Um, a couple of things struck me during the meeting. One is the extent to which we're all stakeholders in what happens. We're all stakeholders in personal archives. You can open a discussion with people who are very far from our field with a question like, well, what would it be worth to you to have a videotape of your great-grandparents? Um, so this is a topic that I think allows us to connect with the public in a much deeper and more pervasive way than maybe we tend to. Um, the second point uh, that came up during this meeting, for me at least, was how conceptually rich uh, and how varied the topic can be. Um, there were a lot of different frames for thinking about personal collections, ranging from things that were fairly prosaic, like scrapbooking, to things that were very deep conceptually, like what's our relationship to time. Um, a third point was around the um, collection activities that we have. There's something like five billion cell phones in the world. More than half of them take pictures. The uh, scope and quantity and scale of digital collections that we have is just growing very, very fast. Part of what I've been trying to do since the meeting and in advance of the meeting is to gather ideas and examples of best practices. And I would be very interested in hearing from anyone here about projects they're involved in um, and problems that they're trying to solve. Um, in the background material, there's a pointer to the website www.personalarchiving.com. And uh, as Cliff said, there are notes up. I'm still waiting. This was a stone soup sort of a conference, and I got voluntary uh, help of lots of different kinds and soon, soon uh, there will be videos up of all the sessions um, waiting on the editors uh, for that. Um, I would be particularly interested and grateful for examples of institutions that have started to grapple with this or that have ideas about what are appropriate policies for uh, memory institutions. There were a number of projects. I'm just going to go down them kind of quickly and then I'll be done. Um, that were discussed at the meeting that seemed like they could be translated into action without a huge investment on anybody's part. Um, one is to start documenting uh, case histories. There are a lot of silos. One of the things that came out during this meeting was the diversity of interests in the topic and people working away on their own project kind of in isolation from, from others. So case studies at this point would be very useful. Case studies might also help illuminate some of the economics of personal archiving. Um, if we can get to fixed costs, like what does it really cost to turn a box of documents into something like a personal archive, then we can begin to engage with funders in a much more intelligent way and with donors as well. Um, another project that was suggested uh, by a researcher at Yahoo, Elizabeth Churchill, is on uh, interface design and interface competition. What if we were able to get uh, a few examples of personal collections cooperating with people in the computer human interaction world and started to uh, have an interface design competition for, for what a good personal archive might look like? Um, Cliff mentioned the way that our data is scattered across different services. Um, Mark Smith brought up the idea of a web sponge. How can we go out and collect all the material that's on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media uh, services and put it into one place? My, my, uh, another colleague in starting the meeting, Judith Zisman, 
um, mentioned Margaret Atwood. Well, Margaret Atwood has books and papers, and she started a Twitter account, and her fans have started uh, to make comments about her materials, and two people have pretended to be Margaret Atwood. Uh, so, so what is the boundary around the personal archive there? Is it, is it what she says? Is it what people say about her? Is it what fake people uh, claim to be? So there's a, there's a real boundary issue that we haven't uh, uh, begun to address in an intelligent, in an intelligent way. Um, and then finally, there's this issue of social consensus. There is a sense that, oh my gosh, there's way too much of this material for us ever to hope to collect it. Um, or it's not important, um, or uh, it's too expensive, we don't have an economic model for it. And I think um, moving towards some social consensus that this is an important thing for us to do, that it's tractable, that it's possible, would probably cause things to move ahead uh, in a much faster way. Um, it looks like we'll have a repeat of this meeting in February 2011. Uh, stay tuned. at personalarchiving.com, and um, I would love to hear from people here about uh, projects they're involved in and questions they have. I guess you already might. So. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> and I'll just say, as planning goes along for this 2011 meeting, as video becomes available for the old one, um, I'll, I'll forward announcements out to CNI announce as well about um, those developments. Let's open this up for comments and discussion, though. Um, when I think about newer things, I think I, one of the first things I run to is a, an analogy of how we did things in the mm -hmm. analog world. Um, so, so let me just take a couple of uh, of, of of the things here and and uh, analogize them. Is that the word? Um, it seems to me that one of the one of the, in the analog world, we don't try to solve all the problems. Um, typically, an archive gets far too much material for them to even look at or organize, and they organize it on a very mm -hmm. high level, you know, in boxes mm -hmm. and in folders. And one of the things that I think has made one of the most significant um, impacts on the archivist's job is the, the, is the commercial sector marketing Pendifex mm -hmm. uh, folders, uh, 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 manila folders and Pendifex, Pendiflex dividers, you know, and, you know, just the act of that and that's permeation within the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the general populace mm -hmm. has served to really serve archivists and then archivists don't even look in the folders, right? They, you know, so the analogy of can you read the stuff that's in there? Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability? They leave that for the researchers. So, so that's kind of one idea from an analogy. Mm -hmm. Could we think of some way to kind of at a high level help people organize things mm -hmm. there, themselves and then we take that in at that high level and we, wor we let the researchers worry about mm -hmm. the lower level. That's, that, that's one kind of idea. Another uh, analogy uh, is the dead people analogy or the get them before they're dead. Mm -hmm. um, at least amongst um, powerful or famous people or people who are concerned with their legacy, museums cultivate these people mm -hmm. long, long before they're dead sometimes early in their career, sometimes uh, mid-career, collectors, artists, mm -hmm. um, and, and they cultivate them and they work with them and they advise them mm -hmm. about how they're, uh, um, uh, they should do certain things mm -hmm. if they're concerned about their legacy. Mm -hmm. And you know, at, uh, at at NYU, we've been uh, uh, actually gotten very involved in some of these things, where uh, particularly with artists that do um, complex and difficult to um, uh, re uh, mount works, um, we we've, we've actually gotten them to hire our graduates, uh, David Byrne, uh, Vito Acconci. You know, they're concerned about their legacy. We're working on Laurie Anderson. We've already done a project with her. 
uh, and she's, she's scared. She's really scared that all of this stuff is not going to be available and, 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 and nowhere to be seen. So the, these, you know, to, to kind of, you know, that, that people who are concerned about their legacy, if they become aware of these things, if you can make them aware, they, if, they're, if they really care about their legacy, scare them. Right? I, I, I mean, we found that pretty effective on the, on the few people we've worked with. So, so, so it sounds like um, the world of, of archives and libraries may really have something to learn from museums in oh, this absolutely. area. Absolutely. Um, and, and perhaps some of the, there, there's some things in the interstices too, like film producers who where I'd imagine the issues are very similar. Yeah. And, um, and even, well, even at NYU with, uh, mm -hmm. um, with our archive, our FAILS collection, mm -hmm. which is an archive, um, among other things, of, of um, kind of cutting edge artists from the 70s and 80s, um, the, the archive, the FAILS archive, cultivates people and uh, uh, has put on shows of people or had events for people long before they died in order to cultivate their collection, either an individual or an organization, um, and, um, and, and really pressured those organizations to get things in order before they come in so that they're not misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. I mean, Interesting a, phrase. Yes, yes. I, I said that purposely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from uh, that's what they say to them, mm -hmm. so that they're not misinterpreted. We we know that interpretation is going to happen in all different directions. But mm -hmm. yeah, thanks for that. Um, other comments or thoughts on this? Um, I, I think what I have is a bit more of a, a comment, but I was very struck by what you were talking about when you were talking about the deeds of gift and trust, because what I'm working on now, I'm, I'm a university mm -hmm. archivist, and I'm working with a uh, recently retired president who definitely has that mixture of the personal and the work records electronically all together but also with our new president, who is one of those who really would like to, he's, he's, he, he's going that sort of route of everything in my professional and in some cases my personal life, I want digital. I want it in the cloud I, and I want you to preserve mm -hmm. it. So, so it's that challenge. But one of the things that I'm noticing is in that deed of gift and in that discussion, what we're running into because I'm with the new president I'm documenting his electronic records every single term so that because okay. I, I don't want them to uh, disappear on me but the challenge then comes in all sorts of issues of um, conf not only confidentially confidentiality and privacy but I'm noticing that in the realm of paper where I never had this at much. In the digital realm, my donors are much more concerned about the sensitive records, the records that if mm -hmm. you look at them out of context, they're, they're, they could have very different meaning. If they, and um, I've had the, one of the donors say to me, they're like, yes, those electronic records, they're slippery. And so it's that, it's that sense that even though I am a trusted and well thought of mm -hmm. archivist on our campus, that it's, it's sort of as if I have to start all over again with them when it comes to their electronic records. It's a new discussion and they're a little bit more concerned than they ever used to be. So now that I'm documenting everybody um, much more early, I'm, I'm not waiting for them to retire or die or anything like that. They're much more concerned than they ever would be about what I'm doing with their records right now. And so that would be a discussion that I would be very interested to see continue and see how we handle this both in an institutional setting but then also with a with the personal archives and those personal settings because I, I work in those as well. 
Thanks, Jeff. Hi. Um, my question is somewhat quick, but it comes from something an archivist told me. I'm actually a computer programmer, but I work with special collections and archives a lot. Um, and at the university I worked in, in 1968, there was a huge riot from the Vietnam War, but also from a whole other issue on campus. And what the archivist basically said to me was, if we have another one of those today, we won't know where to begin to start archiving what happened. So I guess my question is, I'm not sure how to articulate it exactly, but we keep thinking about kind of going out and thinking about the people that might want to donate, but what about the people that we never thought about would eventually donate? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do I start harvesting Twitter feeds for everything at my university for the hope that when something happens, you know, we have a list and I'm not really sure how to think about it exactly, but as a programmer I want to help and I don't know exactly what to do about it. Well, uh, I don't know if this is really helpful, but certainly one of the things that I think there's been some very provocative experimenting on is the notion that there's an event that happens, whether it's a riot or a, national, a natural disaster like, uh, you know, Katrina or an earthquake or um, uh, you know, 9-11 or, yes, a, a good example Howard's reminding me of is the, um, the situation at Virginia Tech a few years ago where people realize very quickly something's happening and um, there's this sort of, um, uh, you know, really the right way to describe it is almost by analogy with the, you know, the kind of observational apparatus in the sciences. Just like, you know, somebody spots something in the sky and they point the, you know, they point a large telescope at it to really see what's going on. Um, uh, they'll do these for events now where they'll start capturing systematically all of the media coverage, as much of the social media coverage as they can get. Um, they will um, often couple that with a strategy to reach out to people who were witnesses or involved and take, um, you know, oral history or other testimony. Um, another piece of it is that they'll try and um, mobilize people who are there to capture material so that it's not just they're harvesting up the, you know, kind of traditional media, but they'll encourage anybody with a cell phone, um, you know, who's got a piece of this to, um, to uh, contribute them. And, and you see these sites now built up around some of these events. Um, uh, Ed Fox from Virginia Tech has been working on a, a project for a, a couple of years um, and has presented on it here um, about essentially a digital library for crisis management and capture. Uh, so that's, that's one piece of it, um, uh, but very much a, a sort of a recognize it when it happens contemporaneously and mobilize to capture. The, this question of, you know, how you find people way later who might have a piece of it, that's, that's, you know, the sort of um, classic problem that, that, that we've always had, you know, where um, uh, many, many people at some point in their lives touched something, uh, you know, that, that might be very significant that often they don't talk about for one reason or another, um, uh, but you'd really like to capture that. Um, Jim? So uh, our, my set of experiences is from a very narrow part of the personal archiving world and sort of the most sort of uh, conservative but close to home for a lot of these institutions slice that is, is not about the big unmoshed five billion cell phones but about individual faculty members and their mm -hmm. personal collections. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what's really, what, what I see a lot of uh, are resource allocation issues uh, facing libraries about how much to invest in in 
documenting, capturing, taking care of faculty mm -hmm. personal collections, image collections in my mm -hmm. case, but it could be other things. So uh, uh, the, the, the case that we see a lot of is the faculty member who has his or her own images and either used to keep them uh, on his own mm -hmm. or used to dump them in a slide library mm -hmm. um, where the investment amount of investment needed to make that that resource useful was pretty minimal. It was maybe you have to put them in drawers. Um, so now, uh, as, as faculty members are showing up or not showing up with their own uh, image collections, uh, the, the institution is faced with, do we invest uh, staff time in, in cataloging um, and in managing mm -hmm. the assets? Um, how much? How do we prioritize what, which collections to do? The difficult political mm -hmm. collection uh, decisions of saying, "Oh, well, your photography is good, or you're at a site that's mm -hmm. really important, and yours is just not," mm -hmm. you know. And then, so we're going to invest, you know, catalogers or graduate student time in documenting that. And these are collections that the, you know, the Picasso four-star system doesn't work. You know, if you're looking at Islamic textiles, you yep. need the metadata out of someone's brain, or you need to put a, a graduate student working with them. And so all those collections either are going to stay private, which is happening, I think, more and more. And so the faculty member manages his or her own, her own FileMaker Pro database, takes mm -hmm. it when she leaves campus, mm -hmm. um, or get into the institutional flow, which is important both for the long-term care of what are the mm -hmm. valuable collections there, important for the institution because then they're investing time in internal collection building that can be used in other courses yep. or things like that but there has to be agreements on sort of who owns what and you know mm -hmm. does a copy stay here and all that stuff so that as i say that's not about the five billion cell phones and what they're capturing those are just the people hanging around our campuses which we're either going to have a role at integrating into what we we do or mm -hmm. or we're not and they're going to be off on their own and they're going to mm -hmm you know, rotten the equivalent of cardboard boxes in their basement, the digital versions of those when, when they die. And so we have, we have lots of case studies mm -hmm. of, of where those investments have been made and what yeah. it takes to do it. And, uh, but you know, but those are, those are just in, in cases that we've run across. But I think how institutions are facing that when somebody shows up and says, here's my camera and I just came back from a dig and you know, there are 900 images and I need them tomorrow, so please catalog them. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a very, you know, important point with a, with a, with a strong message in, in the sense that at least when we talk about the universities, there's a, you know, specific population that you could argue the universities have a, a special responsibility to and a special relationship with, and that's their own faculty. Um, as those faculty build up collections of, of materials and, um, and personal history, uh, which is relevant sometimes here too, um, uh, that needs to be organized and preserved. Uh, I actually, you know, um, find myself thinking a lot now about whether the whole sort of um, retirement process for faculty um, needs some really focused attention because that's actually a very special time in the information life cycle. Uh, many faculty at that point are primarily concerned with legacy and um, uh, with the carrying on of their work and the continued availability of material they've spent a lifetime putting together. They've, you know, sort of moved past this business of I'm reluctant to share data until I'm certain I've gotten everything possible out of it. Um, they've got time, some, in some cases at least, to spend a little time with someone from the library or graduate student helping to organize this material. Um, uh, yet we don't seem to do much systematic, at least at most of the institutions I've talked to. And this is a question I go around asking uh, fairly often as I uh, make the rounds of institutions. Now, it's a little different in the sense that probably the, the material that's of greatest interest there is um, scholarly evidence that the faculty member has, has collected that you want to bring forward as opposed to biographical material. Um, 
but um, you know many many of the the other issues around it stay pretty constant. Um, I uh, I've seen a lot less analysis of that situation than I'd like, and um, uh, I'd I'd really urge you at some point to think about how you might share some of those case studies that you alluded to. Um, uh, we really need a lot more case studies in this area. We're starting to get a little tight on time. Let's take one last question or comment before we wind down. Well, I just, it's mainly a common few ideas bouncing around that I can try to pull together. But um, I'm thinking about my own life um, that it's publicly documented online. Um, it's on Facebook, it's on Flickr, it's on Twitter. and Increasingly, that's what's happening. Our lives are being documented online as we want to present them. And the context in which we do that is really critical as well. So it doesn't make sense to harvest my Twitter feeds and remove them from the context in which they were posted because the, you know, that's really important, especially things like Facebook. And, and I'm reacting to what's going on you know, around me and around my friends that are online and mm -hmm. et cetera. And when people... You see now when people die, those sites, those Facebook pages become memorials. Yes. And it's funny that, you know, we've moved from Friendster to MySpace to Facebook, but you don't take down that MySpace page even though their friends have left because that was the last point in which they publicly mm -hmm. documented their own life. And so it's a memorial. And I can see the potential for, because, um, you know, so many people are now publicly documenting their lives online, that a service will come up that will memorialize you and uh, when you die and, and it'll, it'll kind of pull together your Facebook mm -hmm. and MySpace and Flickr and, and whatever and mm -hmm. Twitter and people will be able to go there. And I think that's going to happen soon. I think it, the time is probably ripe for it. And maybe that kind of service, when it comes, because it will, will be something that can provide a model for special collections for archives because somebody in the marketplace is going to figure some of this out in a way where it keeps the context you know mm -hmm. in its in, it, in it online which is where which is where it belongs um not divorced from that so maybe we'll see that soon maybe we'll start that business <laughs> <laughs> There was a uh, archaeologist discover lost Friendster civilization on the Onion a little while ago. That is <laughs> totally worth watching. It's a video. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I thank you for joining us. This is a this is a topic that, as I say, we'll be returning to in um, you know other fora and future meetings. I, I personally think it's a very central one and. Um, one that you know gradually is going to cause uh, more and more challenges for us and and to the extent we can at least intellectually get out in front of it a little bit it will be very valuable I mean um, uh, the scale of, of, of the problem is is pretty daunting um, uh, but it's it's one where I think we need um, we, we need to seek opportunities to get some intellectual leverage. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have uh, you know, further thoughts, case studies, best practices, things like that, um, please do be in touch. Thanks again. <laughs>